All right, so here we're going to um, apply um, the stuff that we've learned about shock, and we're going to learn more about shock and cardiac arrest. Now, we're going to, um, when we get to the actual cardiac arrest stuff and all, um, a lot of these slides are really just um, the steps into the CPR process and the chain of survival and stuff like that. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that just simply for the fact that we don't need to because you've already had that in CPR and you've had it in EMT. So basically we want to know what shock is, respiratory failure, cardiac failure, and then how we manage somebody after we've resuscitated them. So we know the shock is what? For perfusion. Inadequate uh, cellular perfusion to maintain metabolism. Rest respiratory failure and arrest and cardiac failure and arrest also result in inadequate perfusion, right? Because the heart's not pumping the oxygenated blood through the rest of the body, or if we're having respiratory issues, we're not getting the oxygen into the blood, okay? Our pre-hospital care priority is going to be to restore the conditions of aerobic cellular metabolism. How are we going to try to do that? Glucose and oxygen, but mainly in this case it's going to be oxygen, right? Because we can hook them up with all the glucose they want, but if they ain't breathing, then they ain't going to live. Then we're going to talk about our interventions in resuscitation. We're going to talk about all this stuff. Um, as far as resuscitation goes, our priorities, uh, our skills, maintaining the priorities of the situation, don't get um, tunnel vision when it comes to um, working a code. If anybody's ever worked a code, it's very easy to lose track of what you're supposed to do because everybody else is just nutting up because that patient's <laughs> dead. Well, you know what? You can't kill them anymore. I shouldn't say that because we're recording. <laughs> but all you can do is good for them if you're doing the right thing, but if you're freaking out along with everybody else, you're not going to do good for them, alright? And it requires teamwork. The paramedic on the scene may be the person running the code, but they can't do it by themselves. If you're the highest trained uh, level on the scene, you may be running the code, but you can't do it by yourself. Everybody's got to work together, and if everybody doesn't, it's a complete cluster. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So we've got a momentary pause in the act of dying. Results in a, a physiologic insult that poses a threat to cellular perfusion. And that's pathophysiology of shock. It's not real, that's not worded real well. Um, but Pretty much if you're dying, you're dying, and when you go into shock, you know, it's going to get worse. The body does have some pretty awesome um, compensatory mechanisms, but even those compensatory mechanisms, they fail, and that's where we come in. Without medical intervention to restore perfusion, but pretty much the patient's going to die. Our main goal in a, um, in a cardiac arrest or shock situation is going to be to maintain perfusion or restore perfusion. And how are we going to do that? We're going to oxygenate them and we're also going to give them fluids if they need it to help pump. Now we're going to talk about some issues with fluids as well when it comes to shock. We've hit this in the ground so many times, hypoperfusion, they just don't have enough uh, um, oxygen. The, the blood, there's just not enough blood to trans uh, transport the oxygen. On the flip side of that, there's not enough blood to remove the waste, so we start having a toxic environment in the body. We know that perfusion requires uh, uh, adequate oxygen, but it, to have proper perfusion, we've got to have adequate waste removal as well. We know that it, it's got to have the, the pump. In order to get fluid moved around, you've got to have the pump. 
Blood vessels provide peripheral vascular resistance by maintaining a certain degree of vasoconstriction and when you get into certain forms of shock, the body's not able to manage the vasoconstriction anymore. So then you start having vasodilation because it's not able to constrict the vessels anymore. That's where you start getting low blood pressure and such. And then you need to have a sufficient volume of blood with adequate oxygen carrying capacity. It's like we've talked about before. You can have one hemoglobin cell that, that transports oxygen, but it's not going to perfuse the body as well as if you had 10 hemoglobin cells transporting oxygen. All right? Usually, when we start seeing early signs of hypoperfusion, we see the initial stages of shock. That's where our compensatory mechanisms are going to come in. Once we get to the later signs of shock, the body's just giving up. And it's not because it hasn't fought, but it just doesn't have the energy, the stores, the oxygen to fight any longer. Not to mention, the compensatory mechanisms only go so far. All right, we see shock here, and it can be the result of several different things. And again, shock's going to be just inadequate perfusion. So several different things can cause us to have inadequate perfusion. We have the hypovolemic. That's where we don't have the volume to transport the oxygen. We've got the um, distributive. That's where we're going to, we may have the volume, but we've got some issues with our, our vessels in the peripher, uh, peripheral vascular resistance and we're having vasodilation so we're not having the pressure to transport the blood and that may be a block in the neurons um, the, the, the messages that the vessels receive to contract maybe an exaggerated immune response as, as like when you have an anaphylactic reaction then you have cardiogenic, and the cardiogenic is going to be, the end result's just going to be pump failure. You're having pump failure due to cardiogenic shock, and it, and it can be several different things from CHF, volume overload, from an MI. Why would you have pump failure in an uh, MI? Right. Um, Abnormal electrical rhythm. Why do you think you're going to have pump failure if you have an, some abnormal electrical rhythms? Right, because it's not going in sync. It's, it, it, it's supposed to be a, um, a beautiful concert of electrical activity and mechanical function. And if it's not in concert together, if it's not going together, then you're going to have pump function. The beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Um, may also cause some issues with your pump as well. Then the metabolic and respiratory, this is going to be on the cellular level, whatever reason you're not being able to offload um, oxygen and, and, and get the waste out. Then obstructive, and this is going to be, um, in the case of like a pericardial tamponade, what is pericardial tamponade? Right, it's the, it's, it's, the, the filling of the pericardial sac around the heart um, with fluid and it's not allowing the heart to, to contract and, and um, relax like it should. Or pulmonary embolism. Why do you think pulmonary embolism may cause a uh, shock? Right. It's, it's cutting off the blood flow into the lungs to get external respiration. Or attention pneumothorax may be the same thing except it's in the lungs, but the lungs aren't able to um, expand, right. All right. So we just talked about your mechanisms of shock in the video tried to. I want you to, when you study, I want you to go back and look at your um, these tables here, um, we don't have enough time to go through each one, especially since just about every class we've talked about this. Um, but in hypovolemic shock, 
It's just a decrease in vascular volume, and it may be because of hemorrhagic shock, or it may be because of like a burn where you don't have the barrier of your skin, and you may be losing fluid that way. It may be because of um, um, diarrhea or, or vomiting. It may be of any of those, but it, it, it's, you're just losing volume in the, in, in the body. So don't just associate hypovolemic shock with um, bleeding out, all right? With hemorrhagic shock, though, you lose uh, oxygen carrying capacity. You lose your red blood cells. You, you lose your hemoglobin because you're bleeding out. In other forms of hypovolemic shock, you may just get so dehydrated that you don't have enough fluid to help your blood move around, okay? We just talked about that. Um, when you have hemorrhagic shock, because you're losing fluid so quickly, you start having a decrease in cardiac output, a decrease in blood pressure. Why? Because you don't have enough fluid. You don't, right. You don't have the fluid, the volume. Um, your sympathetic nervous system and your renin-angiotensin systems are activated. Um, This is where your alpha-1, your beta-1, and your beta-2 receptors are activated. And that's where you start getting the uh, vasoconstriction, the body's compensatory mechanism um, for the vasoconstriction. One thing to remember that early in shock, the blood pressure is usually normal. The patient may be diaphoretic, anxious, um, and pale, cool, clammy skin with thready peripheral pulses. But the blood pressure may still be normal. Why is that? Because of compensation. I think this thing just wants to echo everything I say. Now remember, you've got your microvascular perfusion, and that's usually where your, your um, internal respiration occurs. And the problem here is that this is normal um, microvascular uh, perfusion, and so all the blood is getting to the cells through the small vessels. Well, here, the um, the sympathetic nervous system has stimulated um, the uh, the cells, uh, alpha one, beta one, beta two cells, to start contracting. So the precapillary sphincters are going to close off and that's where the shunning of the blood occurs, all right? The precapillary sphincters are closed off so the blood is just going to bypass that area of tissue and continue on in the um, vascular system, all right? Where do we start shunning blood at? Your extremities, right? Because I need my heart a lot more than I need my hands. What's that? They are. They are. You just don't get any to any flesh-eating bacteria like that girl that got her arms ate off recently. In hemorrhagic shock, you've got four stages, and this is important for us to know. Okay. You got your class 1, class 2, class 3, and class 4. Class 1 is up to 15%. This is where we tolerate the compensatory mechanisms are working okay. And then your class 2 is uh, you start getting tachycardic. Your uh, skin starts to become pale because we're starting to get the shunning of the blood. You got delayed capillary refill. Class 3, 30 to 40% of your blood is being lost you're starting to have failure to compensate because your body has nothing to work with because it's all gone. And then class four is 40 to 50 percent and this is where it's usually in decompensate or um, irreversible shock, okay? What is the term we use when the body bleeds out completely? Or, no, hypovolemia is lack of volume but, but when the blood is, is actually, you lose your blood. Starts with these, exsanguination. There you go. There you go.
when we talk about shock in general, it's, it's described as compensated, decompensated, and irre irreversible. Decompensated, you still have a little bit of hope left of, of getting them um, back, but once they get to irreversible shock, there ain't nothing really you can do. All right. Um, I just wanted to talk about the stages real quick um, and just compare it on, on the um, table here. This actually goes into a few more stages than um, what we talked about. You've got the pre-shock anticipation. Um, then you've got the uh, pre-shock. <laughs> then you got compensated, decompensated. There we go. And then irreversible. All right. Once we get into decompensated shock, we start seeing a decrease in the uh, systolic blood pressure. All right. Then we start seeing a rise in the pulse rate. Why? Because it's trying to pulse right. It has less to work with, so it's trying to be more efficient. All right. Lactic acid. What is lactic acid? It's a byproduct of, of cellular metabolism, all right? So when we um, have a lack of perfusion, then we're not able to get the lactic acid out, and we're not able to oxygenate the cells, right? So we're going to start becoming toxic, and the lactic acid is going to start rising. And then as we continue to go on into um, decompensated, our pulse is still going to continue to go up. Our blood pressure is still going to continue to go down. And our lactic acid is going to go up. And if, if we're becoming very acidic, what's going to happen to our bicarb? Why? Because bicarb does what? It buffers. The uh, acid and the, the bicarb work together to keep the pH normal. And then stage five, you just have a crash and burn. Your lactic acid will go way up and your heart rate will come down. Your pressure will come down and all that. I would go back and um, all these things that I'm trying to show you on here are all available to you. Sneaky, sneaky, sir. All right, so we know. We know because it, it, it is hidden, it's hammered in when you're doing your assessments and stuff. Your cool, clammy skin, the anxious patient, um, tachycardic, and all that. So we know what we see um, in compensated and decompensated shock. And I think y'all have got a pretty good understanding as to why it does that. Your breathing rate goes up because you have um, increased CO2 and decreased O2. So we're trying to get the CO2 off and the O2 on. Why is our CO2 going up? Because of poor perfusion. Why does the body start having vasoconstriction? Right. Once we get on into later signs, we have altered mental status and uh, marked tachycardia, not marked tachycardia, hypotension, um, air hunger. And this is just where you're just <gasps> trying to get as much air as you can, and you just can't do it. And then your skin becomes white, waxy, and cold, and then you're dead. <laughs> On the tissue level of shock, you have the ischemic level, the stagnant level, and the washout level. The ischemic level is just where you're starting to get blood flow shunted from the from the cellular level so they're going to start becoming um, ischemic because they're not getting the oxygen all right in the stagnant phase that's where you start getting more hypoxia and acidosis is getting your, your acid is starting to build up more and more in the body but at this point the blood may enter the capillary bed but the um, post capillary sphincter still remain closed and the blood just kind of stagnates in the capillary bed. And what happens when blood stagnates? 
It starts to clot and it also becomes toxic as well. Once we get to this point, it's irreversible. We start seeing a lot of issues on the, the microvascular level. And we'll talk about it a little bit more, but we see stuff called um, disseminated uh, intravascular coagulation. And that's just where, on the very smallest levels, we're starting to get clots in there. We're also getting very acidic, and we can't, it's hard to correct that. Then the washout phase is just um, where the uh, accumulated acid and the clots start washing out into the circulation system, and it's going to kill you. Yeah, I mean, pretty much, um, you just, uh, you're never going to diagnose that in the field, you're, unless they're at the point of the, the obvious signs of death, you're never not going to work a situation unless it's like a mass casualty, casualty situation. Um, but, so you're going to do all you can do, try to give them fluid, get an airway and all that. Once they get to the hospital, they're not going to give up, but at this point, basically what it's saying is that no matter what we do for them, it's still not going to have a good end result. The uh, mortality is going to be a very high percentage rate. <sighs> I really should keep up with these instead of getting ahead of them, shouldn't I? No, that's good. <laughs> if shot's not corrected, we have a lack of energy and a decre decreased pH which leads the precapillary sphincters to, to fail in the ischemic phase. And again, in the stagnant phase, they all clump together. And this is devastating in the washouts. Once we get to um, multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, we talked about that a little bit, MODS. Once we get to where we're having several systems fail, um, death is pretty much going to occur pretty quickly, all right? Because remember, everything works together in a beautiful concert. ARDS is um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. MODS, multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. And DIC is the disseminated intravascular coagulation. Don't have to get real deep on that, but it's pretty much where you start having the clots on the uh, microvascular level. Distributive shock, um, the body's normal compensatory mechanisms is to make the, uh, the vessels contract to keep the pressure up, right? When we have issues with distributive shock, for whatever reason, we're not able to um, activate those alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 receptors. We're not able to activate the sympathetic nervous system, and so we lose vascular tone. So we're not able to contract, so our vessels, they just dilate. What happens to our container when we dilate? It gets bigger. It gets bigger, and if you put pressure through, a, if you put water through a straw, as opposed to the same amount of water into a large diameter fire hose, the pressure is going to be a lot higher through the straw than it will be through the large diameter of the fire hose, right? <coughs> it's the same thing. The, the higher the diameter of the vessel, the less pressure you're going to have. Under normal conditions, both sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system exerts control over the diameter of the blood or the vessels. When we get into this state, we have excessive vasodilation. I mean, the vessels are just going to contract. I mean, uh, dilate to the point to where there's really no point of the blood's just holding in there. There's no pressure to get it through. And the problem comes because you'll have the same amount of blood, you just won't have the, the enough pressure to perfuse. An anaphylactic shock is part of the, the distributive shock. This is just a severe allergic reaction, uh, exaggerated immune response. We'll have airway edema, obstruction, vomiting, and diarrhea. And then we have loss of fluid in the interstitial spaces, which is what? Right. It's not the cell, it's not the vascular system, it's everything else in between. All right? This compacts the effects of uh, vasodilation. 
Septic shock. This is the body's response to a massive infection, a systemic infection. Um, septic shock can happen very quickly. You can be sick with something for two weeks and then once that, that microorganism just releases into the rest of the system, the body's going to do everything it can do to fight it, but you're going to have a lot of this um, vasodilation. Um, you have low blood pressure, high temperature, or even low temperature. Increased heart rate, a lot of issues. In the ICU, we deal with septic shock a lot. These older people that get these severe infections, they end up on a ventilator and it's very hard to get them off. So if, if, you, if you arrive on scene and they're talking about, well, we don't know what's going on with them. They've been sick for two weeks with blah, 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 or whatever. You need to be able to um, identify, well, this may be septic shock. We need to start getting this person loaded with fluids to get them to the hospital. The neurogenic shock is going to be a result of the impaired sympathetic nervous system function, and we've just got an issue in the uh, nervous system um, communication. And so we're going to have vasodilation. With neurogenic shock, you may have a normal heart rate despite hypotension. And again, it's because the communication pathways are blocked off, the heart doesn't realize that we've got hypotension, so the heart's not going to pick up and pump um, as fast. Let's take about five minutes. 